Well, good evening. Welcome to the Bible Study Hour. I am Evangelist Joel McCarvey, and I am coming to you live from my dining room uh, on this Sunday evening. Um, and uh, before we get started, let's pray, shall we? <coughs> Father, we are thankful tonight that we have this opportunity to once again come together and to uh, study your word together. We ask, Father, that you would guide and direct our time together tonight, that uh, all that is said and done will be done to bring honor and glory to you, that will allow your word to be our teacher, to be our guide. Father, we do pray for those tonight that uh, are sick. And, and just uh, in the last week, we've heard of so many who are uh, down with this COVID and uh, suffering with that, as well as other things. And uh, Father, we just lift all of them up to you tonight and ask that uh, your grace and your peace might keep them, strengthen them. And that, uh, yes, we would even ask, that, if possible, that they may be raised up and that your will will be fully accomplished in and through their lives and that you would receive honor and glory. And so, Father, just guide us together tonight in your word, and we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last Sunday night was uh, pretty bad. Uh, this Sunday night's better, much better, really, I guess. But uh, we're still not 100%. Uh, we're still kind of weak and uh, get fatigued easily. But uh, I think we're over the worst of it. Uh, I think Susan has it a little worse than I did. But uh, she's feeling better as well. She still has a, a cough and some chest congestion. But... I think the bulk of it's passed, but uh, we, uh, we got the test, and we failed, and we were both positive, and we've been doing our due diligence to quarantine from everybody, and we've done that now for uh, oh, about 10, 11 days, I guess, um, so maybe Monday or Tuesday we'll come out of hibernation uh, and see, but we'll see how it goes, so... So, just keep us in prayer, continue to pray for us, and pray for our life. There's so many that we have heard of just in the last few days that are, are hurting, that have uh, come down sick, uh, Many, it's, some of them with the COVID, and uh, so we just uh, pray that you will keep uh, all of those in prayer, uh, if you would, and keep us in prayer, and keep uh, Matt and his family in prayer as well. They've been struggling as well with sickness, and so just keep them in prayer, and Cindy and, and her folks and just uh, just the whole staff as we all work together and see how that all comes out. So um, so that's where we are. And, and um, so it's nice to see uh, you. Make sure uh, you get checked in here. I don't see uh, anybody who has said hello yet. Uh, my wife is sitting right across the room and she hasn't even checked in yet. So, uh, but we are here. And uh, we're waiting for you. It is 5 o'clock, right? Yeah, it's 5 o'clock. I a bunch. You what? I a bunch. Oh, I don't have anybody yet. Huh. Okay. Oh, I got 15 people watching. Oh, there we go. Sandra, Brent and, Brent and Sandra Biller are there from Ridgely, West Virginia. There's Norm Dunaway from Mississippi. <coughs> There's Susan from the living room right over there, and uh, D Dwight and Debbie Johnson from Worthing, South Dakota, and uh, Becky and, and uh, Wayne Van Andel from uh, Virginia, slips my mind, Diana Schnoth from Holstein, Missouri, and there's Sue Peck as well from Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania, so... Uh, like I said, we are we are feeling better, but we're not quite there yet. I don't I don't believe we're quite ready to claim victory yet, but uh, we are there, and we appreciate your prayer. You can see my voice is still kind of <coughs> rough, and we still have a, a, a cough and some congestion there as well. But uh, do do uh, continue to pray for us in prayer. Don't forget this coming weekend is the Bible conference in Cumberland, Maryland. And uh, the Grace uh, Bible Conference, the, the Atlantic Grace Bible Conference in Cumberland, Maryland. That will be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, Friday evening, 
Saturday, all day Saturday, and then uh, Sunday. And uh, we'd encourage you, if you haven't made reservations yet, or if you go there, it will be at the Holiday, Holiday Inn Express in LaVale, Maryland. Now, that's, that's just a suburb of Cumberland. But um, the Holiday Inn Express in LaVale, Maryland, and that will begin Friday evening and then be Saturday and Sunday. So if you're in the area, uh, do stop down um, <clears throat> and uh, take part in that conference. It is uh, looking at our past, our past as far as what we call a grace movement or a grace message. Looking at our past and looking at our present and looking at our future based upon our past. And so uh, it's going to be an exciting conference, I believe, and, and uh, so we'd encourage you, if you're in the area, to stop on down and uh, check us out. And uh, so we'd appreciate that. I see there's Darlene Hamoki uh, checking in. Uh, I believe Darlene is in Iowa, I believe. And so there's uh, Sue Klepper as well, and we say hello to her. And um, as others check in, we'll try to make acknowledge that and uh, go on. All right, you know, in our study of rightly dividing, now I, 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 I said last week that I, I held up this chart, and, uh, <clears throat> and the way the phone works, when you use the phone so that you can see the backside, it actually reverses the image. And so I, I, I held this on last week, and it was actually backwards, uh, for you, and I, I, I knew that, but I, last week I wasn't thinking about that. And so I turned the phone around this week so that this is right for you this week. And this is our uh, chart on a period of transition. And um, we have uh, that, that program of God. And we're going to look, looking at this as just two programs, the two programs of God that we've talked about uh, throughout our study here and our study on Tuesday nights, when we get back to that study on Tuesday nights, looking at the unfolding of the word of truth. But we're looking at these two programs of God. And of course, this is the, the main program that we had been looking at, really beginning in Genesis chapter 12 and coming through. And, and um, we really have to understand there are these two programs if we're going to rightly divide the word of truth. And, and that's the problem in much of Christendom is, uh, and, and actually, I, I really believe in an in a increasing way, there is a general failure to see two programs. Uh, they see one unfolding program going throughout all of Scripture and just adding things to it, and, and it goes through and it flows through Scripture. Rather than seeing the two distinct programs and two distinct audiences uh, that God is speaking to. And, and here, and actually we could write down here Genesis chapter 12, uh, but with the calling of Abram, and, and his name would be changed to Abraham, and God would make a covenant with him concerning a people. He would give to him the, the ritual of circumcision, and, and through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's name would be changed to Israel, and he would become actually the father of 12 sons, and from those 12 sons would eventually come the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and so we saw that last week, beginning here in Genesis, and actually coming through the so-called Old Testament, and then actually con con uh, continuing on into what many refer to as the New Testament. But in, clearly, when you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are not coming on to new territory. Uh, we're still under the law. We're still under that Old Testament uh, covenant. We're still under that Old Covenant. Uh, God is still dealing with the nation of Israel. And the Gentiles are still, as Ephesians 2 describes them, without God, without Christ, aliens from the covenants and promises that God had made with Israel. And so we have that, that program. But then we come to the midpoint. A portion of the book of Acts. And remember, the book of Acts is not a doctrinal book, but it is rather a, a history book, and it is a book that presents, I believe, the rise of the church and the fall of Israel. And it gives to us that, that gradual increase of the church and the gradual diminishing of the nation of Israel. And so we have this, what we call this period of transition. 
from one to the other. And, and it is my personal belief that uh, during this period of transition, you still only have one gospel. That during this transition, there is going to come a point in time when that gospel of the kingdom, which was back here, would cease. Would cease. And the gospel of the grace of God would pick up and become the gospel. And so anybody who is uh, saved, and I, I, I put that in quotation marks, but anybody who is saved under the kingdom gospel is part of this kingdom program and, and is looking for that physical, earthly program that God will establish here upon the earth as he promised in his covenants and promises. However, anybody saved under the gospel of the grace of God in this new program, this dispensation of the grace of God, they will be a participant in that heavenly program of God. And, and uh, that is why we, as, as members of the body of Christ, are looking for that rapture of the church. And we'll talk about more of that in another week. But the rapture of the church, when the church is going to be caught out of this earth world, and at that point God will pick up his dealings and conclude his dealings with the nation of Israel. And that actually would be on out here. But we have these two programs, a dispensation of Israel and a dispensation of grace, or the dispensation of the body of Christ, the church, the body of Christ. And we have this transition between the two. And we mentioned last week that uh, I believe, that, and I and others believe, that this transition began, the church, the body of Christ, began with the separating out of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, to be the apostle to the Gentiles or to the nations. Uh, back here, God was dealing with a nation, singular, with the apostle Paul. He sends him as the apostle to the nations, plural, now including all nations. And so Paul would be sent out into all the world, to all the nations, to preach the gospel. So beginning in, in Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul now is separated out, cut out from this old program, and is sent out on a new mission, and that is to declare the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, apart from any ritual, apart from any ceremony, apart from the law of Moses, this is a new, a new and distinct message, a new and distinct gospel. And it is given to Paul, and it is the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul will go into all the world with that. And as he does that, then, anybody who's saved under that gospel, then, would be part of that heavenly program of God. And so it's just important that we see these, this transition that occurs within the book of Acts. Now, last week, generally speaking, uh, many of us would put the end of the transition in Acts chapter 28. Uh, at least biblically. Others would say, no, it, it extended past Acts 28, and it probably went more to like A.D. 70, which would only be about three years past Acts 28, and, and that would be the, with the physical destruction of, of the temple and, and of Jerusalem uh, by Titus in 70 A.D. And, and I, like I said last week, I, I'm not really going to quibble over these few years here, um, but I do believe that, biblically speaking, from the scriptural point of view, that it, begin, that it ends in Acts chapter 28. Uh, that God had ceased, totally ceased, and Israel at that point is totally and completely uh, diminished and has turned their back uh, upon God. Now, last week when we were together, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to take my watch off right now. Uh, I don't have a clock here like I have at the studio that I can watch, uh, so I don't want to, I don't want to make sure I take up too much of your time. But last week, as we were uh, drew things to a close, we were looking at uh, starting to look at some of those areas where we have to see in this period of transition uh, different things that are going on, and and I really begin to understand why are they going on. Uh, what is really happening during that period? 
And, and so we, we need to look at that and we need to see that uh, as it goes along. So last week, we saw that in, in Paul's early ministry, uh, we found that, that he truly did, uh, that he was baptizing. Um, I want you to go to Acts chapter 19 and, and look there for a moment with me, if you will, just as a, uh, one more little thing to throw in on, on the uh, baptism part. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 19... Excuse me, let me get a little sip of hot water here. The Apostle Paul uh, is, is passing through the area uh, around Corinth, and uh, he's coming to, towards Ephesus. And, and while he does that, in, in chapter 19, in verse 3, it says, And he said unto them, or, or verse 2, well, let's just go with verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples there. Now, disciples are just students. They're, they're the learners. Uh, Jesus called 12 disciples, and they were with him for three years, and then he, he spent 40 days teaching them, and, and they would become apostles. But they were his early disciples, his students, his learners, and he had others as well. But he said unto them, that's the disciples, Paul said unto them, the disciples, Have you received Holy Ghost uh, since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, What then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, verily, bap John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy, Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. Now, there are some who would say, who, who say here, that Paul took these men, and he water baptized them. Uh, and, 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 uh, in essence, that, that does present a, a, a little issue as to nowhere else are people baptized who were water baptized were baptized a second time. W to what end were they baptized a second time? They knew John's baptism, and what was John's baptism? John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You could look at Mark chapter 1. He came preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That was what they were baptized for. That was the baptism of the day, the water baptism of the day. And so why would Paul take these men, that, that's, that's the only baptism they knew about, and baptize them? Uh, and, and, and really what you have to look at is the verse, and, and, and really what, what is the verse saying? And, and um, what Paul is re rehearsing here is exactly what happened on the on this on this road towards Ephesus, and and he says then Paul uh, then said Paul then said Paul so here's Paul speaking <clears throat> um, that that um, and, and Paul will now give this message that John verily baptized with water with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ. And when they heard this, this is Paul still speaking. Paul is reiterating what happened on the road here as he encountered these disciples. And Paul is still speaking here. And, and, and what he's saying is uh, that, that, that these men came. All they knew was the baptism of John. And, and when, they heard, when they heard that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and... and um, that is John's baptism. That was John's baptism, to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when, when Paul had laid his hands on them, uh, now they spake with tongues and prophesied. And, and so here in, in verses 4 and 5, you have what Paul did or what Paul said. And in verse 6, you have what Paul did. And Paul laid hands on them. 
And, and they were baptized with Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon them. We're still in that transitional period. We're still in that apostolic period. We're still in that period where the Holy Ghost would come upon them. These are, these are not body disciples. These are kingdom disciples. These are students of John the Baptist. And, uh, but they have apparently been out of touch with John and, and don't know what happened at Pentecost. For some reason, didn't hear what had happened at Pentecost or what was going on here. And, and so now Paul hears them, re reiterates what they already have, and now through his apostolic power, he lays his hands on them and they receive uh, the, the baptism of Holy Ghost, that power comes upon them, That's, that power of the Holy Ghost comes upon them, and they will speak with tongues, and they will prophesy. And he does that through the laying on of hands uh, through them, and, and, um, and there were about 12 of them all together. Uh, again, 12, you know, numbers aren't just thrown in there. There weren't 10 of them, there weren't 9 of them, there weren't 13 of them, there weren't 14 of them. Again, you have, there's that number 12. And anytime you see that number 12, you understand that somehow this is linked back in numerology back to Israel. God always deals with Israel in numbers of 12. And, and so here we have this 12. And, and you have, you know, you go throughout the scripture and, and you have that. You go to Revelation and you have the, the New Jerusalem with 12 gates. And, and all these things are, are there. Everything is always 12. 12 tribes. You have the 144,000. 12,000 from each tribe. You have all of these things in 12s. And these people, again, are related to the kingdom program. And so this is, not, this is something that Paul was doing. But he is giving to them Holy Ghost. He isn't water baptizing them. This isn't a water baptism here. And, and uh, let me just, let me, before we move on, let me just say one other thing concerning that. And that is, uh, today, as we saw, you know, if you read, as we read last week, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, where it says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one baptism today. And in, re in reality, when you look at Acts chapter 19, neither one of them are the baptism today. Neither one of them. Remember last week I said there were like 16 different baptisms in Scripture? Well, that's two of them there, but neither one of them are the baptism we have today. There's, there's yet another one. And, and uh, so in Ephesians chapter 4, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, what, what is that one baptism? that we have for today. If it isn't water baptism, and it isn't being baptized with Holy Ghost power, what is it? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12 says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit. Now, we aren't baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost power. Now it is the Holy Ghost, the person of the Holy Ghost, taking us and baptizing us or placing us into Christ Jesus. And he says, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink, into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. And so, all the, when, when the moment you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, at that very moment, as we said last week, the Holy Spirit takes you and places you into Christ, into the body of Christ. And then, the Holy Spirit seals you there. He seals you there. So, you are not baptized with Holy Spirit, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. And you're not baptized with water. You're baptized by the Spirit into Christ. Into Christ. You are identified, Romans chapter 6, with his death, burial, and his resurrection. So just as he died, you died. Just as he was buried, you were buried. Just as he rose, you rose. You are identified with that as you are baptized into Christ, made one with Christ, and then the Holy Spirit, like I said, takes and seals you there, and nothing can break that seal. Nothing can break that seal. And that's what we have in Christ Jesus. 
And that is the one baptism that we have today. Now, I know there's a lot of churches that practice water baptism. Some churches pro practice water baptism as a, as a means of grace, receiving grace. And, and uh, they'll say, well, the water baptism, it's not a work, but you meet the grace of God. You meet grace down in the water. Well, if I have to get down into the water to meet the grace of God, that's a work on my part. That's an effort on my part. Um, and, and others say, well, it's just a testimony. It's, a, it's an outward sign of an inward uh, testimony, of an outward sign of an inward cleansing. Uh, they put all kinds of things to it, but it is a requirement. It is a requirement. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, if you want to join their church, if you want to teach in their church, you have to be water baptized. Well, if it's just a testimony, what's the purpose of that? Um, what's the purpose of the requirement if it's only a testimony? Why can't I just stand up and give a testimony of, of my salvation, of what Christ has done for me and what he means to me? And what, you know, why can't I just do that? Why do I have to get down in the water? Why do I have to get down in the water? And then, of course, they'll give us that thing where you have to follow Christ in baptism. Well, every time they just mix the stir the pot and stir the pot and stir the pot to where it becomes very confusing as to whether is this really truly voluntary or is it really mandatory, and is it really part of my salvation? And I've talked to a lot of people over the years when you say to them, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Have you, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Oh, yes. Well, how do you know? Well, I was baptized on, and then they give me a date. And, and they, they equate that baptism with their salvation. And, and uh, that's a very dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. Baptism can't save it. There are people who believe today you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And to be honest with you folks, I think they are far more scriptural than the run-of-the-mill Baptistic teaching where it's just for membership in a church or it's just as an outward sign of an inward cleansing. It's just a testimony. Uh, clearly in Mark chapter 16, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's clear. You can't get any clearer than, than that. And some of those folks who say, well, it's just a testimony, they, they switch things around. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when they said to Peter, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Be baptized for the remission of sins. When Ananias spoke with Saul of Tarsus, he gave them that same kingdom message, arise and wash away your sins. Baptism wasn't just some uh, testimony they had to do. It was a requirement. It was a requirement of cleansing. It was, a, it was a take on what the Old Testament priesthood had to do as they entered into that priesthood. And remember from Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, where God says he's going to make the nation a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests. And so John the Baptist came preparing Israel to be that nation of priests for that earthly kingdom. So he came baptizing them. He came baptizing them. And, and Jesus was baptized, uh, identifying himself with Israel under the law. And, and Saul of Tarsus was baptized to wash away his sins. This is, this is the kingdom gospel. That is the kingdom gospel. But that's not the gospel of the grace of God. Under the gospel of the grace of God, the work of cleansing has been done at Calvary. It's been done at Calvary. Our sins have been washed away. Our sins have been washed away. The death penalty has been paid. And so the Apostle Paul uses baptism here as a term of identification, uh, of being placed into, immersed into, without the idea of being taken out, but being put in and, and left in, left in. And, and so we see that. <clears throat> and we see that with, with uh, what he's taught here in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 uh, and verse 13, where we are put into, baptized by the Holy Spirit into, into Jesus Christ, into Jesus Christ. Well, you know, as we were finishing last week, uh, we get into another area, and, and uh, 
And 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 listen, uh, we're going to come back to it again, but in just a moment. But you say, then why did Paul baptize? Why did Paul baptize? Why did Paul water baptize? Because there are places where Paul certainly did say he water baptized. So so why did he do that? Well, let's add to water baptism the idea of the of the sign gifts of the sign gifts. Now in in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul talks about these, these gifts that were given. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 8, he says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, in a way, I'd like you to think of this childishness uh, as, as growing up. As growing up. And, and as we begin our transition upward, as we are increasing, think of that as, as your youth. And, and as, we're, as we're beginning growing uh, we're, we're, we're children, and, and we're learning, we're growing, we're growing. We're not mature yet. We're not mature yet. We haven't, we haven't learned all that we need to know yet. That's why we have to go to school for so many years here. And we need to learn and grow and read and study and think and, and, and listen. And, and so we grow. And he says, when I was a child, we can think of this period of time as, as our childhood, as our learning time, our growing time uh, that is there. But if you go then from to over to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 1, look what we find there. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest by, to his saints. Now, as we come to that passage of scripture, we have to see something that's very important. The Apostle Paul says that he has been made a minister, a minister, a minister uh, of this, this mystery program, this program that was hidden in the mind of God, this program that was not previously made known, not previously revealed, but was kept secret, kept secret, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 through 9, kept secret. Uh, since the world began, Romans chapter 16, the, the last several verses of, that, of, the, uh, of Romans chapter 16. And here he says again, it, was, it is uh, hidden from the ages and from generations. Ages and generations. Ages. Aeons. It, that, that would go back uh, thousands of years. Thousands of years. And, and looking at the, at the chart again, if we were to look at the chart, uh, at our dispensational timeline chart... We would say that, that the ages would be clear back here. It would go clear back here in this time. This would be thousands of years back here from Paul. And, and it would be back here. And then uh, generations would be, would be right here. Just a, a short period of time. A short period of time. But from ages and generations, this was hidden in the mind of God. Hidden in the mind of God. Not in the word of God. Remember, during this period of time back here, you have uh, Moses writing the first five books of the, of the so-called Old Testament. And you have David and Solomon. and You have Ezekiel and Daniel and Jeremiah and Joel and Amos and Micah and Obadiah. And all these writers back here are writing, and yet none of them are writing anything about this. None of them are writing anything about this. Even though some of them will write things about this, over here, none of them will write anything about this. They will look down through the corridors of time, and they will see these things happen. 
and, and that's you just have to it blows your mind away when you think of it. These writers back here, Ezekiel and Daniel, Daniel prophesying of this period of time right here as the end times would look down through the corners of time and see that, but totally missed this. Totally missed this. Totally missed this. <clears throat> That's where the uh, his prophecy of Daniel 9 is so key to understanding. When he talks about the returning, coming out of the captivity, and going back into the land, <clears throat> and then... After so many years, the Messiah would come, the Messiah would be cut off. And then, then he talks about the, the destruction, and he talks about the tribulational period and this prince that is going to come. And you think, bam, this happened, bam, this happened, bam, this happened. Bam. What, what about this? What about this? <clears throat> Daniel's prophecy all of a sudden now has a big gap in it. There's a big gap in it. And that gap, that gap <clears throat> is this right here. Because he wasn't shown that. That wasn't for him to see. That wasn't for him to see. <clears throat> and so when you come here to Colossians chapter 1, and it says that from ages and generations was, was hidden, but now. Anytime you see those but nows, that brings you right up to where Paul was, is speaking. To, to our current age, this present dispensation. But now is made manifest to his saints. So what does he say? It was given, verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me, that's Paul, for you, that's the body of Christ, to fulfill the word of God. Now what we just wrote over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where these gifts were going to be given, but they were temporary in nature. They were temporary in nature. They were as we were children growing up, as we're children growing up, these gifts would be given. But who were they given? For? What were they given for? What were they given for? And, 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 and to who? Who was receiving these gifts? Where were they being practiced? All of that is important for us to understand. Um, so you have all of that going on there as, as we go. Uh, so... So as the church increased, there were these gifts that were there. There were these things that were there. They were there to show that Paul was indeed uh, an apostle sent by God. They established his apostleship. They were there for that. They were there to show that what Paul was saying truly came from God. Uh, it was there for that purpose. That's why the gifts were given. Um, but, but there again, though, to whom were these gifts given and where were they practiced? And, and, and when did they cease? Well, here, they, they were there until that which is perfect would come. That which is perfect would come. And the word perfect there means complete, mature. All right? And, and what Paul says here is his gospel, all right, even the, uh, in verse uh, 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the Word of God. To fulfill the Word of God. And that word fulfill there means to make complete. To make full. You see, I think, I think what Paul's Gospel does is it brings the Word of God to its completed form. It brings the Word of God to its completed form. I believe that... that those books that, are, that we have in our Bible written after Paul were actually written during the same period that Paul was writing. That, that when Paul, when James and Peter, those were contemporaries of, of Paul. Those weren't written later on afterwards and written back. They were written around the same time as Paul was there. And, and um, I, I believe all of them were written back and you could take them and you could put them back into that period of time. If we're looking at our chart here, this would be, uh, the writings of Paul would be right here, and, and the rest of these uh, so-called New Testament writings would have been written during this period of time here, but they were written to this diminishing church, this diminishing group. And they were written primarily for application right here. Right here. And, and it's interesting 
that their primary application is here, and when you read those books, you find out that behind them, behind them, they're very prophetic books, and they're speaking about this time right here, and they're speaking of the plight of Israel and what Israel must do during this period of time right here. And, and in essence, that's the way, uh, I don't know that man put it together this way, but I think God did, arranged the Word of God. The Word of God starts with Genesis and starts with these first 12 chapters. Then we have the chronology of the, old, of the rest of the Old Testament bringing us right through here. Just brings us right through here. And then we get into the so-called New Testament, and that takes us right through here. Then we get to the writings of the Apostle Paul, and that takes us right to here. And then we get to those what some call the general, general epistles. Uh, I believe those are the tribulational epistles. And that takes us to the end in the book of Revelation. And, and that's the order that the book with the Bible is put together. And it follows through just like that as you go through. You can see all of that unfold as you go through the word of God. So we come here and, and Paul's writings fulfilled the word of God. They brought that, mature, that thing to a maturity. So therefore, by the time we get to the end of Paul's writings, or, or we get to this period here, we're now reaching full maturity. We're now reaching maturity. And, and so when we come through here, we are growing, we are growing, we are growing, we are growing, and we're reaching maturity. And the thing is, you know, after this period of time, in Paul's writings, he doesn't refer to that any longer. He doesn't refer to those gifts anymore. Only, only, only here. Only there. And, and when you get into his prison epistles, which are written here during this period here, uh, all he writes about is the one baptism. The one baptism of Ephesians 4. That's all he writes about. That's all he writes about. And, and you don't see those other things there uh, during that period of time. So... <clears throat> So when you get to the when you get to, uh, to 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 our program today, now, because Paul's works fulfill the word of God, when that which is perfect is come, when that which is perfect is come is is neuter gender, um, and and it's not talking about a person; it's talking about an object, a thing. And I think he's talking about the word of God, the word of God, and and when the word of God is complete. In its fullness, then that which is in part, when this is full, all right, then that which is in part or that which is temporary is going to fade away. It's going to die away. It's going to go away. And and you say, well, you know, uh, well, who was God dealing with? Who was God dealing with? Um, and and if you recall from our study in in uh, on the, uh, our Tuesday night study. Uh, you recall that when God sent Moses into the land of Israel, into the land of Israel, what, what did he give him? What did he give him? Remember, he gave him those signs. Remember, it was put your hand in your cloak and pull it out, and it was leprous, and then he put it back in and he pulled it out, and it was healed. It was, it was made whole again. He threw down his rod, and it became a snake. And then he picked it up, and it turned back into a, a, a rod again. And, and that was called the first and the second sign. The first and second sign. And then there was the changing the water into, into blood. That was a sign. And all these signs were given. And why were they given? Remember, Moses was going back to, to his people, to Israel. Back into the land. Back into the, where they were in bondage. And, and he said to the Lord, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe that, that you've sent me? And, and of course, God said, well, set, you tell them the I am sent you. The I am sent you. But what if they don't believe me? Well, you give them this. You, you do this. And, and he showed them. And he gave them those signs. He gave them those signs. And you remember at the time we said that the signs, the first time, the first time, the, the idea of signs, as presented there in Exodus, the first time those, that idea of signs is given in Scripture is when God begins to deal with the nation of Israel. 
with the nation of Israel. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 22. says, For the Jews require a sign. The Jews require a sign. Now, why is that? The Jew requires a sign. The Jew requires a sign. Uh, I'm just going to look at something here. <clears throat> John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 48. Turn to it if you want to. I'll read it here for you. John chapter 4, verse 48. Well, uh, yeah, verse 48 for time's sake. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, ye, ye will not believe. Unless you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And what do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? For the Jew, for the Jews require a sign. They, their, their faith, their faith was not, was not strong of itself. They had to see something. They had to touch something in order to believe. They, they couldn't accept it unless they could see it. And, and uh, you see that throughout God's dealings with the Israel in the, old, in the old. But they required a sign. And so, here during this period, as Paul is out and about and among the Jews and among the synagogues, we find him doing these things, these signs. Uh, we find him speaking in tongues. We find him speaking about that. We see him writing about the sign gifts, the sign gifts. All of that is there. We find him baptizing. We find him baptizing. So we find all of these things as we go along, as we go along. But we, we clearly say, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians there, that these things are going to come to a close. Yes, they're in operation right now. But a time is going to come where they're going to cease. They're going to be no more. Their, their usefulness will come to an end. And, and, and they will pass away. They will pass away. And when will that happen? Well, I believe that happened. That happened when the Apostle Paul received... His written revelation. His revelation. And when the word of God was put down, those things came to an end because the word of God was now complete. All we need to know, we have contained in the pages of this book. In the pages of this book. <clears throat> you know, the problem with, with much of evangelicalism today is, is the reliance upon feelings, emotion. Um, how do I feel? Uh, I, I want to go to church. I love to go to church because I, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. And I have people that, that have told me they don't like to go to church because it's like going to school. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to sit and just have somebody talking to me. I want to feel good. And, and, and uh, we've gotten away from real Bible teaching in churches today to where we've gotten just feel good preaching. Uh, marshmallow fluff. And, and people go home feeling good and, and, and really know very little uh, about the Word of God. Very little about the Word of God. Uh, I remember a number of years ago, I, I, I got some notebooks from a church Bible institute. And, and the things that they were studying were, were great if you were playing Bible Trivial Pursuit. But there really wasn't any depth to anything. Um, it's important that I can name names of mountains and name names of rivers and, and, and things like that. I'm not saying that's, that's wrong. And they may know more about that than I do. I, I don't know. 
but what happened on the mountain and why did it happen now, those are the kinds of things that they should be interested in but the church has turned turn to itself and it, it wants to just feel good and and um, it, it doesn't want to it doesn't want to learn it doesn't want to learn it doesn't want to grow it doesn't want to be taught and, and that's what that's what the church really needs is some good good Bible teaching and um, <clears throat> so so we have we have water baptism being practiced we have uh, the sign gifts being practiced by Paul uh, we have circumcision uh, being practiced by Paul but but listen here now let's get down let's deal with that and then we'll say but why why was he doing that why was he doing that well look at Acts chapter 15 um, in Acts chapter 15 we have the the Jerusalem council that is called and and um, <clears throat> Paul will go there Um, verse 1 and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses you cannot be saved now what they were saying was true what they were saying was true circumcision was required under the law and when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Well, what was the dispute? Well, well, Paul wasn't teaching circumcision. Paul was teaching the completeness of the person in Christ by faith, by grace, through faith, plus nothing. And, and these were guys who said, no, 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 no. You have to circumcise. You have to circumcise. <clears throat> and... Um, and so it's verse 3 then it said being brought on the way by the church they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and they caused great joy unto all the brethren and when they were come to Jerusalem they were received of the church uh, and of the apostles and of the elders and declared all things that God had done with them now the church there is not I don't know why they use the church all the time because that's very confusing it's, it's, it's the it's the, the, the assembly there in Jerusalem. This is not the church, the body of Christ. These are not church people. This is just the church of Jerusalem. This is a kingdom church. This is a kingdom group. This is the 12 apostles, the 11 apostles by now. But, uh, and, but there rose up of, of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses and the apostles and elders came together to consider that. Now the Pharisees, they were the law keepers. And, and they would be strict in that. You have to keep the law. You have to keep the law. And, and Paul was saying, remember just earlier than that, in Acts chapter 13, he said here, be it, verse 30, 38, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That's Jesus Christ. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And the Pharisees are upset here because they see, oh, he's attacking the law. Well, he really was. The law had been nailed to the cross, Colossians chapter 2. It had been taken out of the way. And, and it had been fulfilled. And circumcision was no longer necessary. It was no longer a requirement. But, but they're saying they have to be. They have to keep the law of Moses. They have to keep the law of Moses. And, and uh, if you go over to Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, you have, you have really what I think is a second account of the same thing. I know there's difference of opinions here, uh, but I think it was the same council. Um, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. That because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. 
to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, you see, I think this is the same council, because if it's not the same council, they're dealing with the same people on the same subject. And I think the subject is settled. Uh, it was settled back then, and it's, it's settled. And the subject is circumcision. And, and Paul brings Titus, who is a Gentile. And he's not circumcised. And it's not necessary that, that he be circumcised. Um, but he brings him along. He brings him along. Um, but, but Paul knew this is not part of the program. This is not part of the program. From the very beginning, he knew it was not part of his program. That it was just part of that which was temporary. That which were those signs, miracles, wonders, that baptism, which was a sign of their belief and their faith, that circumcision, which was a sign of the covenant with Abraham, all of these were, were things that were directed towards Israel and Israel's relationship to her God. And if it was towards Israel, why would Paul do it? Since he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Why, why would he even do this if he's the apostle to the Gentiles? Well, very quickly, we're almost out of time. Go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And I think this is a very key point to truly understanding Paul's early writings. Paul's early writings. And, and perhaps we'll need to come back and, and, and start here next week. But in, in Romans chapter 9, and... and and uh, remember, in Romans 9, 10, and 11 are somewhat parenthetical in nature. Now, some, some even claim that Paul is preaching a different gospel here. I, I, uh, I disagree with that. Uh, I, I, I believe that that is not really what's happening here. Now, I know there's many out there who are going to, you know, maybe be throwing a hymnal at their, at their <coughs> phone right now or their computer, but... I don't believe Paul was teaching a different gospel. I think you have to understand what Paul's talking about in 9, 10, and 11. And I think as you begin here, you really get a sense for it. In, in chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and a continual sorrow in my heart. <laughs> For I could, if for, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now time sake says I, I need to quit. But let me just let me just say here, I want you to think about that, these words this week. Think about what he's saying here. Think about Paul's thoughts. Think about Paul's past, where he was in the past, what he did in the past. Um, and knowing what he did in the past, think about his feelings in the present, his, the emotion in the present, based on his past, for his, for his people, according to the flesh. Well, that would be to the Jew. He was a Jew. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. And we are out of time. We are out of time. So we will pick up right there uh, in Romans chapter 9 next week. Uh, I trust that as we try to put things together here, maybe it's still a little confusing. <clears throat> we'll try to put things together. We'll try to make a, a real close it up and bundle it up together for you really good. But it's very important that we understand what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Understand the difference <clears throat> between this program and this program. This program has been set aside for a season. Today we are in this program. And, and understand this, this transition that we've gone through to go from here to here, where we are today. And if we don't see this, if we don't see this in Scripture, then, then we open ourselves up to contradictions, we open ourselves up to confusion. And so if nothing else, I, I want more than anything else that you truly understand
how to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you find things like this, why, well, that Paul, why did Paul do that? That we have an understanding as to why was Paul doing this if it's not really part of our program? Why did he do it? And so next week we'll, we'll draw that, we'll try to draw a string and pull that all together uh, next week. Now, as I close, let me just close with this. <clears throat> we haven't mentioned it much today, but I never want to close a broadcast without giving you the opportunity. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to know that the one who loves you died for you, paid the price of your sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. That Jesus Christ has paid the price of your sin. He shed his blood and he died for you. And now he offers to you a free gift of life. A gift that is received by faith and faith alone in him. And if you've never taken that step of faith right here, right now, in the quietness of the moment, wherever you might be. In your innermost being, you say, yes, I believe Christ died for me. And right here and right now, I'm going to put my faith, my trust, my belief in his finished work on Calvary's cross for my salvation. I don't want to trust in my baptism. I'm not trusting in my church. I'm not trusting in my benevolence. I'm going to trust solely in the shed blood of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on my behalf. When you take that step of faith, you pass some death on the life. And if you take that step of faith, I'd love to hear from you. You could drop us a card. I know I don't have it on the screen this week. But just to Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. That's Bible Doctrines to Live By. <coughs> Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. And if you just send me a, a card, I'll send you a little booklet, Beginning Your Life in Christ, and a Bible to go with it. Just write and ask for it. Let me know that you've accepted Christ, and we'll send one of those to you right away. Thank you for tuning in, and so until we meet again next week, I'm not sure yet about Tuesday night, but until we meet again, God bless you, and have a good week. Bye-bye.